These videos that we make are intended to be educational resources, really primarily for other cornea specialists who are looking to do really complicated surgeries. I myself, I'm watching YouTube videos all the time and I'm trying to find some of the best surgeons and learn from them and copy the things that they do. And this is why we make those videos, to sort of pass off some of the information that we ourselves have gleaned from one source or another. And that means lots of the videos in this channel hopefully are not just amazing, sparkling success stories. They're also videos of things that we've screwed up or things that we've done wrong or mistakes or challenges that we've had. And that is the nature of the video that I want to show you today. It's a complicated DMAC case that we did in the office just a couple of weeks ago. And I want to show you the case and show you the mistakes that we made doing this complicated case and what we learned from the operation and how you may avoid making the same mistakes yourself. The setup for this eye is this is a patient who was referred to us by another really good cataract surgeon. The patient had had cataract surgery and had a problem and an ACIOL was placed the cornea ended up decompensating and then the patient had had multiple desects that had also failed. So when the patient was sent to us, she had this ACIOL which was deeply embedded in this disfigured iris and it was all socked up against the back of her cornea with a failed corneal transplant and terrible vision. So the way that we have started to address these eyes now is in a staged procedure. Stage one, in situations in which you have some grossly offending ACIOL, to do an operation to remove that lens and replace it with a new scleral fixated lens. And then in a second procedure to come back and do a DMEC. In this patient's operation to remove her ACIOL, the ACIOL was also deeply embedded and enmeshed in this horribly disfigured iris. And so the operation to remove her ACIOL also entailed removal of her iris. And this is sort of a side point, but I think it's an important one that in many of these patients with these retrocorneal membranes, which are bound up in iris and lens, you have to remove all of that crap from the eye or there's no chance of a new transplant surviving. So her original operation involved removing her lens and her iris and her failed DSEC and then glue IOL scleral fixating a lens to the wall of the eye. That was a month ago. And then a month later, she comes back and she's ready for her DMEC. And this is that DMEC surgery. We're doing it in the office under topical anesthesia supplemented by a sub tenons block, which is also the way we did all of the previous work that I just described to her high. And you'll see that she's got fresh vicral sutures in the eye because the original operation was just a month ago. That's her glued IOL sitting there, well centered in the anterior chamber. And what I'm doing now is the Bruce Allen technique of stringing a proline suture web across the eye to provide a trampoline meshwork for me to unfold the graft on top of. I'm putting air in the anterior chamber after I've just strung that proline mesh around and I'm using it to look to see if there are any little lingering rests or remnants of Desmase membrane left behind before I inject the new DMAC graft. I'm making a wound here now infrotemporally to facilitate action with my left hand. I'm a left-handed surgeon and so I'm going to inject the graft with my left hand where I feel like I have better control of it. And these little preceding early steps that fast forwarded through to show all of the highlights of the operation, but the graft unfolding, I'm going to show you that without any edits with frequent little pauses to show you problems that I encountered and things that could have been done differently. Now I'm injecting this graft into the eye using a glass injector. And I like using a glass injector, and I used to prefer a Dork cannula. The Dork uh, injectors are great because they fit through even a 2.2 millimeter incision. They have a very smooth, easy delivery into the eye. However, you can rocket the graft into the eye with a Dork cannula. So nowadays, I usually prefer to use a glass cannula and 
typically the more goiter variant of that cannula because it's less likely to shoot the graft into the eye around and behind a lens like this, okay? Now you'll also notice another problem, a mistake that I've already made, and that is this little trampoline webbing that I put in the eye to provide some support for the graft. I got lazy when putting this into the eye. Normally you want an odd pattern of passes across the eye and then turn 90 degrees and then again um, orthogonal to those original passes. Bruce Allen describes three passes and then five passes crisscross to make a firm solid mesh web. But because I got lazy in this case, I just made three passes in each direction. So the spaces here in the webbing are large. They don't give me nearly as much support, and they also don't crisscross far peripheral enough. If I had made more passes, which would have taken more time, I would have better support and better control when I'm injecting the graft into the eye. So to recap, a key mistake is I should have made it at least three by five if not five by five or five by seven, it would have taken a little bit longer, but I would have had much better control and much lower risk of losing the graft into the back of the eye. So here I'm going to inject the graft, and you'll notice that as I'm just sort of delicately, gently puffing it into the eye, as it starts to sneak into the eye, you'll notice that the graft looks a little large. Now, I like using a large graft when I'm dealing with an eye that has a hyper deep chamber because a large graft occupies space. It stretches out into the angle and allows you to get compression when otherwise you'd be unable because with an absence of an iris here, you obviously can't pin the graft against the iris in the back of the cornea. But if you wedge the graft out in the angle, you can get it to open up. So a large graft has some advantages. But here, the graft is so big. This is a 10 millimeter graft. I really, I used a graft that's too large because now it's still stuck in the wound, even though it occupies the entirety of the space of the anterior chamber. So I'm gonna to have to poke it in and the graft is gonna start diving back behind the trampoline web and into the back of the eye. So already I've made a mistake in that I haven't put enough passes of the suture webbing and the graft is slightly too large. And as I go poke it into the eye, I'm gonna to start to lose control over it. So already here, the graft is starting to dive into the back of the eye. Now, I'm injecting fluid because one of the key mistakes that you don't want is a hypotenuse eye. If you have a hypotenuse eye, the graft gets sucked into the back of the eye behind the eye well. And you'll notice that even though I'm injecting saline into the eye, the eye is starting to shrink. It's starting to shrivel. And as it collapses and crumps, that graft is being sucked into the back of the eye around the edges of the lens. And I don't have the protection that I need because I didn't make enough passes of that suture webbing. So here I notice that the graft is starting to deep six and I'm trying to inject fluid to resist that suction tendency of the graft to move, but I'm already noticing I'm missing part of the graft expanse and it's teetering there on the edge of the lens and I'm getting worried. So I'm gonna go into the eye with these coaxial forceps and try to grab the graft and drag it open, but perversely, because I'm using the main wound and I'm burping the wound, the eye is getting softer and that suctioning force is increasing and I'm at a high higher risk of losing the graft. And now I'm telling the patient to look at the light and she's moving the light and as she wags around, the eye deflates even further. So mercifully, finally, I've got the graft grabbed just in the nick of the time, but look, the eye is completely collapsed and it's soft and it's hypotenuse. And if I let the graft go, I worry that, that I am in big trouble for what's going to happen. So a major mistake is I should not have told the patient during that critical moment, look down, look at the light, because as they start to wave their eye around in the eye, you start to lose control over what's going on. So I should have shut up and said nothing during that critical component of the operation. Now I've got the graft held, so at least I know I'm not going to fall, it's not going to fall. 
and I want to check the orientation. Is it right side up or is it upside down? So I'm changing my illumination pattern with the microscope. I'm switching directly to coaxial illumination. So I can use my cannula through a paracentesis located 90 degrees away, and I'm going to try to check the Motsuro sign. But before I do that, I'm trying to disengage this forcep, but the forcep is pinched onto the graft and the jaws won't open, and so I'm having to drag the graft out of the eye and sort of push the graft off the edge of the forcep just to get it to disengage. So now the graft is hanging halfway out of the eye. The eye is soft. This is, things are moving from bad to worse, basically. Now, a key mistake that I'm about to make here, because I'm not finished making mistakes in this operation, is you can see from this light pattern reflex on the cornea that the eye is collapsed. The eye is still extremely soft. It's hypotenuse. So I'm at risk of losing the graft into the back of the eye from the suction force of things being pulled down. What I should do now, while the graft is securely pinched in the main wound, is I should deepen the chamber and inflate the eye with saline through a paracentesis. But I'm not going to. What I'm going to do instead is push the graft back into the eye with this cannula. Now, normally when you have the graft hanging out of a main wound, in order to reposit the graft in the eye, just like when you're repositing a prolapsed iris. If you have floppy iris syndrome with cataract surgery, you want a soft eye when you're trying to push the iris back in. When you have a graft sticking out of the wound, you want a soft eye so you can stick the graft in. So psychologically, that's the reason that I didn't deepen the chamber. But it was a mistake because now we have the graft back in the eye. That was no problem. But look, already, we're already at immediate risk of losing the graft again. So it's already a major problem. So I'm trying to firm up the eye. I'm injecting fluid to counteract this suctioning tendency. And now it looks to me that the graft is upside down. I can't really tell, but I think the graft may be upside down just here from my on-foss view. So I want to reach in and grab the curl and pull it. And the purpose of doing that is if I can flip the graft over using the pin and roll technique, I can turn it manually. I can grab the graft and drag it over to flip it upside down. So I'm going to use these coaxial forceps again through a paracentesis located inferiorly. The problem with doing that is that it's almost never a good idea to use coaxial forceps through a paracentesis. They're so big. Even these, which are, I think, 23 or 25, they just don't fit well through a paracentesis. They're snug, and they don't glide through. And you end up shoving the whole eye over, and it, it, it just doesn't allow good, smooth movement. So if you're using coaxial forceps to interact with the graft, you almost always need to do that through the main wound. I was resisting that. I knew that, but I chose to try the paracentesis anyway because I'm so afraid of using the main wound in this case and burping fluid out and softening the eye and increasing the suction force. I tried something that I knew wouldn't work. I tried to use those coaxial forceps through a paracentesis. So now I'm remembering, no, that doesn't ever work. It never works, so use those forceps through the main wound. So I'm trying again. I'll use the forceps through the main wound, but you'll notice that the eye just softens up when I do that, and it's just tough to see what I'm doing here. So I abandon that plan for fear of pushing the graft off the edge of the lens and back into the eye. So now what to do? Well, I'm trying to maneuver my cannula into one of these paracentesis, but it's tough. It's tough to get into the para because the eye, again, is so soft, it's collapsed. And so even the paracentesis that I have aren't accessible to me. Even when I know where they are, it's still a problem. So the ongoing theme of this operation is the eye is soft, and I've not taken the opportunities to firm it up and deepen it when I had the chance. If I had to do this operation again, what I would do is I would have an anterior chamber maintainer in one of the paracentesis connected to a source of fluid. And then periodically, I would inflate the eye and deepen the anterior chamber with the AC maintainer 
rather than just allowing the eye to go soft like I am. So here I am now trying to use these coaxial forceps to grab the graft through the main wound and it seems similarly difficult. So now I'm trying to figure out what to do. So here what I decide to do next is use the cannula to try to interact with the edges of the graft. And as I use the cannula through the main wound, I find out serendipitously, fortuitously, thank God, the graft is actually right side up at this point. And that's what I'm figuring out now. This is me checking the Motsuro sign. And you'll notice the tip of the cannula turns blue. The, can the graft is mercifully right side up. So I'm just performing the help yourself technique to push the graft over and to center it inside the eye and to manually unfold the graft. And you'll notice that the graft is more or less staying unfolded. And that's one thing that I did right during the surgery is I specified the use of donor tissue of a 70 year old or older because older tissue curls less tightly. And so it's more able to stay open under its own power. So here I've got the graft mostly unfolded. I'm pushing it out over directly with my cannula into the recesses of the eye, into the angle. This is a tri-corner hat configuration and that's a winning configuration, which means I can lift it. And here I am putting an air bubble up underneath the graft. And now I'm gonna inflate the bubble and fill the anterior chamber. And now the graft is firmly, entirely applied to the back surface of the cornea. And I'm going to pressurize the eye firmly with air. And now at this point, I can just go around and cut all of these proline sutures and remove them from the eye. And so that way, the eye is left with none of this adventitious material in it. I just cut the stitches and pull them out. And that's the end of the operation. That's the end of the case. So I show this video because this was a really challenging case. This is an eye that's basically unicameral. It's post vitrectomy. It has a scleral fixated lens. And you're worried about doing DMEC and dropping the graft into the back of the eye. I mean, it's a major concern, okay? Um, but I think that DMEC is possible in this eye, just like it is in all eyes. And usually it's surprising surprisingly simple to do the surgery as long as you keep just a few principles in mind and you don't make boneheaded mistakes. So the good things that we did during this operation were, um, I think it was good that we did a proline web. I mean, that was a really, really nice feature. It's certainly nice to have that safety net to support you to prevent the graft from dropping it into the back of the eye. But certainly it was a mistake to not do the webbing enough, to not make more passes. I think it was also a good thing to use a large graft, although it was a mistake to use a 10 millimeter graft. Probably if I had to do this eye again, I would have used something more like a nine millimeter graft. I think it was good to use an older donor. I think a 70 year old donor was a good, nice thing to use, but I think it was a mistake to allow the eye to go perpetually soft during the operation and give me continuous heart attacks that the graft was going to drop into the back of the eye. The force that pulls or sucks the graft into the back of the eye, because it's not going to go down there by itself, is a soft suctioning action of a hypotenuse eye. So the way to prevent that is to make sure the eye is inflated at all times. And if I had to do it again, I would make sure to have an anterior chamber maintainer connected to some apparatus that I could control to periodically inflate the eye with air. So um, this operation was a learning experience for me. I hope if you're considering doing DMAC in a similar situation, you can avoid making some of these mistakes yourself and uh, end up a little bit happier and more comfortable with the operation. Thanks so much for watching.